Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Dr. Vageshwari Deswal, Professor of Law at Faculty of Law, Delhi University. We are doing this course on Substantive Criminal Law. Today we will be discussing Lesson 8 titled Criminal Conspiracy and Attempt. So students, in the previous lesson we discussed what are inchoate crimes, we discussed what amounts to abetment. Today we will be continuing with those inchoate crimes and discuss the other two inchoate crimes which is a criminal conspiracy and the other one is attempt. So first of all, let us try and understand what is criminal conspiracy. In general parlance, the word conspiracy implies the secretive plotting or planning by a group of persons to do an act which is either harmful to someone or forbidden in the eyes of law. Legally, the term conspiracy implies an agreement between two or more persons to commit an illegal act or accomplish a legal purpose through illegal action. Criminal conspiracy is recognized as an offense as it is an agreement to contravene the law by doing something that is either forbidden by law or doing something that is permitted via forbidden means. So, the minimum number of people to constitute a conspiracy should be two and there should be an agreement to do either an illegal act or an act which is perfectly legal but when it is sought to be done by illegal means. So under section 61, when two or more persons agree with the common object to do or cause to be done. So what is important here? There has to be an agreement and the agreement has to exist between two or more than two people. And there must be a common objective. Those two people or more than two people who have agreed to do this act, they should have arrived at a consensus regarding some common objective that they seek to accomplish through this conspiracy. So when two or more persons agree with the common object to do or cause to be done, A, an illegal act or an act which is not illegal, by illegal means, such an agreement is designated as a criminal conspiracy, provided that no agreement except an agreement to commit an offence shall amount to a criminal conspiracy unless some act besides the agreement is done by one or more parties to such agreement in pursuance thereof. There is an explanation which clarifies it is immaterial whether the illegal act is the ultimate object of such agreement or whether it is merely incidental to that object. Clause 2. Whoever is a party to a criminal conspiracy to commit an offence punishable with death, imprisonment for life, or rigorous imprisonment for a term of two years or upwards shall, where no express provision is made in the Sanhita for the punishment of such a conspiracy, be punished in the same manner as if he had abetted such offence. Other than a criminal conspiracy to commit an offence punishable as aforesaid shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term not exceeding 6 months or with fine or with both. So now 
let us examine in detail the essential ingredients of the conspiracy one by one. So, foremost is requirement of an agreement. The essence of the offense of conspiracy is the fact of combination by agreement. The agreement may be express or implied or it may be in part express and in part implied. The gist of the offense of conspiracy lies in the forming of the scheme or agreement between the parties. Mere knowledge or even discussion of the plan without proof of agreement that would not be enough. The offense of conspiracy is committed as soon as the conspirators enter into an agreement and it continues unabated so long as the agreement is terminated by completion, abandonment or frustration. The actus reus that is the physical component in a conspiracy is the agreement to execute the illegal conduct and not the actual execution of the same. It is not enough that two or more persons pursued the same unlawful object at the same time or in the same place. What is important is to show a meeting of minds or to show a consensus to bring about the same effect. It is not necessary that each conspirator should have been in communication with every other conspirator nor is it essential that each conspirator must know all the details of the scheme or be a participant at every stage. What is necessary is the agreement for design or object of the conspiracy. There is an old judgment, an English judgment in which the courts ruled that a conspiracy consists not merely in the intention of two or more but in the agreement of two or more. So, you see two people can have an intention independent of each other unless and until there is a consensus between the two unless and until they have arrived at an agreement amongst themselves till that time we cannot say that they have conspired together. So, a conspiracy consists not merely in the intention of two or more but in the agreement of two or more to do an unlawful act or to do a lawful act by unlawful means. So long as such a design rests in intention only, it is not indictable. When the two agree to carry it into effect, the very plot is an act in itself and the act of each of the parties that is a promise against a promise actus contra actum which is capable of being enforced if lawful, punishable if for a criminal object or for the use of criminal means. The second ingredient of conspiracy is that in addition to there being an agreement in existence, the agreement should be between two or more than two persons. Now here we are talking about natural persons. See for conspiracy there must be two or more persons natural persons not legal who are parties to such an agreement. Why? Because it is the number and it is the pact or the agreement which give weight to that agreement and create danger for others. One person cannot conspire with oneself not even in different capacities. However, a single person may be indicted for conspiring with persons who are unknown, dead, uncaught or incapable of committing the crime or immune or have been pardoned. In cases where a person is charged with having entered into a conspiracy with the head of the state or a foreign diplomat. Now here why am I talking about the head of a state or a foreign diplomat? So as to examine that what would happen in case the other person with whom the accused has entered into a conspiracy is a person immune from criminal proceedings then what would happen in such a situation? Then what happens? If a person is charged with having entered into a conspiracy with the head of a state or a foreign diplomat or with a public servant whose sanction for prosecution is denied by the competent authority, 
then such a person may be convicted alone for the offence of conspiracy. The rationale behind this is that criminality in cases of conspiracy lies at the stage of agreement and if the agreement between two or more persons can be proven, the requirement of law is satisfied irrespective of the fact that one of them cannot be tried or the other one is enjoying immunity from criminal proceedings. What is required to be proven is the presence of an agreement between two or more persons with an unlawful objective or with a lawful thing that is to be done by unlawful means. That would be it and for that even a single person can be punished provided it can be proven that there were a minimum of two people who entered into an agreement. When two or more persons enter into a conspiracy, any act done by any one of them pursuant to the agreement is in contemplation of law the act of each of them and they are jointly responsible therefore. Thus, everything said, written or done by any of the conspirators in execution of or in reference to their common intention is deemed to have been said, done or written by each of them. The reason for punishing conspiracy is the encouragement and support that co-conspirators draw from each other prompting them to commit wrongs, something which they would not dare to commit alone. The next, uh, the next requirement to constitute a conspiracy is the agreement which exists between two or more persons must be to do or cause to be done either an illegal act or an act which is not illegal by illegal means. See every agreement which is against public policy or in restraint of a trade or otherwise of such a character that the courts will not enforce is, it is not necessarily a conspiracy. An agreement to be a conspiracy must be to do that which is contrary to or forbidden by law as to violate a legal right or make use of unlawful methods such as fraud or violence or to do what is criminal. Except in cases of agreement to commit an offence, no agreement shall amount to a criminal conspiracy unless some overt act is done by one or more of the parties in furtherance of such agreement. In criminal conspiracy, an overt act is not necessary to constitute the crime of conspiracy when the agreement is for commission of an illegal act. In agreements to commit illegal acts like murder, like theft, the parties would be guilty of criminal conspiracy even if they do not do anything in pursuance of the agreement. But Overt act would be necessary when the object of conspiracy is commission of an illegal act not amounting to an offence. For example, if the accused entered into an agreement to effectuate a breach of contract between two persons which furnishes a ground of civil action, then in such cases some overt act besides the agreement would be necessary to constitute the offence of criminal conspiracy. Now, what is the proof of conspiracy, how do you establish that there was a conspiracy, an agreement which existed between two people? See the essence of conspiracy is the presence of an agreement between persons to do one or other of the acts described in section 61. The said agreement may be proved by direct evidence or may be inferred from acts and conduct of the parties. There is no difference between the mode of proof of the offence of conspiracy and that of any other offence. That is, it may be established by direct evidence and even by circumstantial evidence. According to section 8 of the Bharatiya Sakshya uh, Adhinayam 2023, this deals with the doctrine of agency and if the conditions laid down therein are satisfied, the acts done by one are admissible against the co-conspirators. There was a judgment in 1981 
Mohammad Usman, Mohammad Hussain, Maniyar and others versus State of Maharashtra in which the Supreme Court held that for an offence under section 120B of the Indian Penal Code that is criminal conspiracy, the section uh, earlier before we got this Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita, it was section 120B of the Indian Penal Code which was dealing with the offence of criminal conspiracy. So, because the judgment came in 1981, that is why what the court says, for an offence under section 120B of the Indian Penal Code, the prosecution need not necessarily prove that the perpetrators expressly agreed to do or cause to be done the illegal act, the agreement may be proved by necessary implication. So, even if direct evidence cannot be adduced by implication by circumstantial evidences also, the factum of conspiracy can be proven. Now, conspiracy is a continuing offence. What do we understand by that? The crime of conspiracy is complete as soon as the agreement is made, but it is not a thing of the moment. It does not end with the making of the agreement, but would endure as long as there are two or more parties to it intending to carry into effect the design. A conspiracy is a continuing offence and it continues to subsist as long as its performance continues. That is, conspiracy continues when part of the acts pursuant to the agreement are agreed upon, attempted or done. Whenever one of the conspirators does an act or series of acts, conspiracy is deemed to be in continuation. So, conspiracy does not come to an end till the time it is executed, accomplished, abandoned, resigned or frustrated either by choice or by necessity. In transnational offences committed in furtherance of a conspiracy, the offence will be regarded as a continuing one. So, whenever any acts or omissions which constitute an offence are done partly in India, and partly outside its territory, the conspirators continuing to be parties to the conspiracy would be liable under section 120B and they would obviate the need to obtain sanction of the central government under section 188 of the CRPC. The law does not require all of them to be present in India or continue to remain in India. Students. Continuance of conspiracy is a threat to the society against which it was aimed at and should be dealt with at the earliest possible opportunity. After talking about criminal conspiracy, let us talk about the crime of attempt. Students, an attempt to commit a crime is also a crime in itself. Why do we call it an attempt? is because it was not successful. An accused with intention, preparation does any act towards the commission of the crime. If he succeeds, the act translates into a crime. But where he does not succeed, then it remains an attempt. So now the question is, whenever a person with intention and preparation does anything towards the commission of the crime, what circumstances would count that as an attempt even if it fails and under what circumstances would a failed act not amount to an attempt. So, that is something which we will be now talking about. Commission of a crime requires involvement at the physical as well as the mental level. At the mental level, the involvement is manifested by intention or knowledge which and the physical element of involvement manifests itself in the form of preparations and movements towards the commission of the crime. So, there are generally four successive stages in the commission of a crime. See now, why do we call these the four successive stages? Because it is only when the first stage is completed that we move on to the next stage. So, these stages are successive to one another. The first stage is that of intention. Normally, 
no person is to be punished for having any sort of facts. You might be having any wrongful intention in your mind till the time you do not prepare anything in furtherance of such intention or till the time your intentions do not translate into any wrongful actions, a person cannot be punished. Beyond intention comes the stage of preparation which is the second stage that is when you start either collecting material or weapons or something to give effect to your intentions that is the stage of preparation. After intention comes preparation and once your preparation are complete and when you set out to commit the crime that is when you do any physical act in the furtherance of your intention and preparations now that is where attempt begins. Now if attempt is successful it translates into an offence but if the attempt is unsuccessful it nevertheless is punishable as a criminal attempt. Now let us discuss these essentials or these essential four stages of a crime in detail. The first stage is intent. There is a Latin phrase cogitationis Penum nemo patitur, which means that no one should be made to suffer punishment for mere intent. And that is why irrespective of the wrongful intent, irrespective of the malice that you might be having towards anyone, till the time you do not do any overt act in furtherance of such criminal or bad intention, the law does not punish anyone. So anyone might be thinking anyone, anything. But till the time those thoughts they do not come out in the form of either preparations to do some criminal activities or an act which has the potential to harm someone to translate into a crime till that time no one can be punished for merely having a criminal intent. The second stage is preparation. Considering the gravity and enormity of certain crimes and their repercussions on the society at large, the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita provides for certain exceptions wherein a crime is punishable even at the stage of preparation. See sometimes the preparations are also so peculiar in nature that they preclude the likelihood of their being meant for innocent or legal purposes. Thus the exceptional crimes which are punishable at the stage of preparation itself are 1 collecting arms etc with the intention of waging war against the government of India. See someone having such an intention and collecting hordes and hordes of arms, can you say that the act is innocent in itself? If the act is innocent in itself, it is, if it is not meant to be used for any wrongful purpose, then why is a person collecting so many arms? Okay. So, he needs to have some justification for the same otherwise if it can be established by the prosecution that the person had a wrongful intention and that is why he was preparing to collect arms with the intention of waging war against the government of India then even at the stage of preparation the crime is punishable. Next is committing depredation on territories of power at peace with the government of India. Next is making or selling of instruments or possession of material or instrument for the purpose of counterfeiting coins, government stamp, currency notes or bank notes. See why would any person innocently have the die or have the molds for counterfeiting coins, notes or government stamps. If a person has that, if a person has gone to the extent of procuring that, preparing that, it is indicative of the wrongful intent that it is meant to be used. So even at the stage of preparation such a crime is to be punished. Next is making or selling of instruments or possession of material or instrument for counterfeiting. Possession of forged or counterfeit coin, government stamp, currency notes or bank notes. Now why are you in possession of forged notes? It means that you intend to use them that would be detrimental to the economy of a country. So these are crimes which need to be nipped at the earliest possible opportunity and that is why at the stage of preparation itself these crimes they have been made to be expressly punishable under the provisions of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. Next is 
possession of forged or counterfeit coin, government stamp, then making preparation to commit dacoity or making or possessing counterfeit seal etc. with the intent to commit forgery punishable under section 338 and making or possession of any instrument for counterfeiting a property mark. So, you see in all these crimes mentioned here in all these specific uh, provisions the crime is punishable at the stage of preparation without evidence of having done anything more. So, if the person has an illegal intention and has committed preparations which are indicative of his criminal intention as in, and his intention to carry the preparations into effect further so as to translate into any crime, it is at that very stage also that a person can be apprehended and punished. Now, let us try to understand the definition of the term attempt. Neither the Indian Penal Court nor the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita has provided any definition of the term attempt. Sir James Stephen in his Criminal Law Digest had attempted to define attempt as an act done with intent to commit that crime and forming part of a series of acts which would constitute its actual commission if it were not interrupted. So, the point at which such a series of acts begins cannot be defined, but it depends upon the facts and circumstances of each and every case. So, what is the particular precise moment when intention and preparation is complete and the accused has moved into the stage of attempt? So, that is again something which we cannot objectively determine that would depend upon the peculiar facts and circumstances of each and every case. So, an act done with intent to commit a crime, the commission of which in the manner proposed was in fact impossible is an attempt to commit that crime. So, the offence of attempting to commit a crime may be committed in cases in which the offender voluntarily desists from the actual commission of the crime itself. So, what are the theories of attempt? What attempts to, uh, uh, what amounts to a criminal attempt? At what stage precisely does an act make a transition from the stage of preparation to the stage of attempt? What distinguishes an attempt for preparation? So, students, these are some of the questions which have been raised from time to time and various theories have been developed to decide the same. These theories are the result of academic as well as judicial expositions on these issues. So, some of the theories which are more popular are, first one is rule of proximity, then there is doctrine of locus ponitentiae, third is the equivocality test and fourth is the doctrine of impossibility. Now, let us discuss about these theories in detail. First one is the rule of proximity. So, the test of proximity is used to determine how close the accused was to the commission of the crime. An act would amount to an attempt only if it was sufficient close to the forbidden consequences. So, when we talk about an act being sufficiently close, that means how proximate was it? Was it remotely connected or was it immediately connected with the immediate uh, with the intended result? The act need not necessarily be the penultimate act towards the commission of the crime, but it must be some act necessarily related to the commission of the crime. The measure of proximity is not spatial or temporal, but the efficacy to result in the forbidden consequences. So, what is required to be proven in the rule of proximity is that how close was your act to the forbidden consequences 
and as I have just clarified, it does not mean how close you were to the victim in terms of distance. Here it is how close was your act to achieving the forbidden consequences. Was the act actually capable of resulting in the forbidden consequences? Was it that close? Now that would determine whether the act of accused amounted to a criminal attempt or not. The next theory is doctrine of locus poetentiae. Now this is a Latin term which literally translated means time for repentance. Legally locus poetentiae is the opportunity of withdrawing from a proposal to enter into a contract or bargain before the deal is finally closed and the parties are legally bound. In criminal law, this means abandoning the intention of committing a crime before it has been completed provided the withdrawal is voluntary as well as genuine. See, temporary backing off due to fear of being caught without abandoning the evil intent or design and waiting for a more opportune time to strike would not be eligible for protection. What is required is that there should be a genuine repentance and the person should back off and should withdraw from the intention of committing the crime. It is a well accepted principle of criminal law that whenever there is an intention to commit a crime, a time for repentance is always to be allowed until there is some overt act towards the commission of the crime. This privilege of abandonment of unlawful design is recognized only up to the extent of preparation. That is when the act of accused has not moved beyond the stage of preparation. The stage of preparation exists till the time some act is committed which amounts to a step towards the commission of a crime when it translates into a criminal attempt. The opportunity for repentance ends with the first criminal act. Then the next theory is the equivocality test. Acts of an accused person towards the commission of a crime would amount to attempt only if they unequivocally indicate the intention of the accused to accomplish his objective. When a person intends to commit a particular offence and conducts himself in a manner which clearly indicates his desire to translate his intent into action and in pursuance of such an intention, if he does something which may help him accomplish that desire, then it can safely be said that he has committed an offence of attempt. The equivocality test determines whether the acts of the accused person are indicative of his intent to commit a crime or not. The acts should be self-indicative of the proposed criminal objective in order to qualify as a criminal attempt. The act must reveal with reasonable certainty in conjunction with other facts and circumstances and not necessarily in isolation an intention as distinguished from a mere desire or object to commit the particular offence but it must be suggestive or indicative of such intention. Attempt is constituted when the culprit takes deliberate and overt steps that show an unequivocal intention to commit the offence even if the step is not the penultimate one. Thus, the act of accused must indicate unequivocally and beyond reasonable doubt the intention to commit the offence. So that is when the act is so clear in itself that by looking at the act you are very clear about the intentions of the accused. The act unequivocally supports the intention of the accused towards commission of the crime. So that is how the equivocality test operates. Moving on to the next one, this is the doctrine of impossibility. 
it has two forms legal impossibility and factual impossibility. An act that is considered legally impossible to commit is usually accepted as a valid defense. An attempt is considered to be a legally impossible act only when the defendant has completed all of his intended acts but his acts fail to fulfill all the required elements of a crime. Thus, attempting to do what is not a crime would not amount to a criminal attempt. What, be a, what would be a criminal attempt? Only when you attempt to do an act which is a crime in itself. If you attempt to do something which is not wrong, which is not legally wrong, which has not been declared to be a crime, then even an attempt to do that act would not be a criminal attempt. So, it is very clear that it is only an attempt to commit a crime which is a criminal attempt. Then factual impossibility is another defense. If a person attempts to do something which is practically impossible to do such as trying to kill a person by engaging in witchcraft, putting a spell on someone or burning him in an effigy or cursing him with the intent of causing hurt, then such acts will not amount to criminal attempts as the accused is attempting to do something that is factually impossible. See there might be discussions and debates over this because there are some people who genuinely believe in witchcraft. But we have to go by scientific temper and science does not admit of witchcraft or voodoo or killing people by burning their effigies or casting a magical spell on others. Now, th these are things which science strongly disbelieves. Sometimes the factual impossibility is owing to ineptitude of the accused. In such cases, the accused fails in his attempt because the person resorts to insufficient means for committing the intended crime. Either his own act is intrinsically harmless and defective or is inappropriate for the purpose he had in mind. This could be due to his undeveloped state, or state of intelligence or ignorance of modern science. But the fact is that the preparation was faulty so the act could not be successful. The failure if it is due to supervening circumstances or circumstances independent of the accused's volition then it amounts to a criminal attempt but where offence remains incomplete because something yet remains to be done which the accused is unable to do because of his incomplete preparation then the offence does not move beyond the stage of preparation. So, here what is the test? That is what was the reason why the attempt could not succeed? Was it because of some supervening factors? Was it because of some circumstances beyond the control of the accused persons? Then the act would amount to a criminal attempt. But if the attempt was unsuccessful because of the accused's own faulty preparation, suppose the accused tries to administer a substance to someone believing it to be poison whereas actually it is a harmless substance. So even if he has given that believing it to be poison but it is not poison. Now here if that person wanted to uh, procure poison, he asks a shopkeeper to provide him poison. The shopkeeper doubts his intentions and that is why the shopkeeper deliberately gives him something which is harmless. Now here his preparations have failed, here at his attempt have failed, why? Because of supervening circumstances that was the change of the medicine which was asked for or the change of the poisonous substance that was asked for by the accused and it was changed by the shopkeeper. So, here criminal attempt would be constituted, but if the accused by his own picks up some powder which he believes to be harmful, which is in fact harmless, which does not result in any harm to the victim, then in such cases why has the attempt failed? Because of faulty preparations and then in such cases the accused cannot be held guilty for attempting to murder. So, now let us see what the law says about the offence of attempt. Punishment for attempting to commit offences punishable with imprisonment for life or other imprisonment. 
Earlier, this was contained in section 511 of the Indian Penal Code, but in Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, now the offense of attempt has been defined under section 62. So, what 62 provides is a formula for calculating punishment in those cases where there is no express provision for that particular attempt, for an attempt to commit a particular crime. See, in the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, there are some offenses which are considered so serious that their attempts they have been made separately and distinctly punishable. But then, uh, the rest of the offenses also, an attempt to commit any crime is also a crime. So, what would happen if we were to prescribe separate provisions for attempt to commit theft, attempt to commit decoity, what would happen? We would be having so many additional provisions also. So, that is why what has been done that some offenses which are very, very serious for them, we have separately defined attempt like there is attempt to commit murder that is separately punishable also, attempt to commit suicide that is separately punishable also. But for the rest of the offenses, there is this formula for calculating the punishment which has been laid down under section 62 because it says in the language itself, whoever attempts to commit an offense punishable by the Sahita with imprisonment for life or imprisonment or to cause such an offence to be committed and in such attempt does any act towards the commission of the offence shall, where no express provision is made by the Sahita for the punishment of such attempt, be punished with imprisonment of any description provided for the offence for a term which may extend to one half of the imprisonment for life or as the case may be, one half of the longest term of imprisonment provided for that offence or with such fine as is provided for the offence or with both. So, what does the law say? That all criminal attempts are punishable, but where there is a specific provision for punishment of any crime, then that provision will apply. But where no express provision is made by this Sahita for the punishment of such attempt. Then how do you punish such offences? Imprisonment of any description provided for the offence. So, if rigorous imprisonment has been provided, then the accused would be punished with rigorous imprisonment. If what has been prescribed for that offence is simple imprisonment, then the accused will be punished with simple imprisonment. And what shall be the term of such imprisonment? a term which may extend to one half of the imprisonment for life. See, when we have to calculate what amounts to imprisonment for life, so in the chapter titled punishments, we have already discussed the formula for calculating life imprisonment in order to determine fractions or as the case may be, one half of the longest term of imprisonment provided for that offence. So, how do you understand? Suppose the law says that such and such offence is punishable with imprisonment up to 10 years. Then in such cases, the punishment would be maximum 5 years for attempting to commit that crime. If the crime is committed, the judges have a discretion to award imprisonment for a maximum 10 years. But if a person fails to succeed in the attempt, the criminal attempt has nonetheless been committed. So, the accused would still be punishable, but now what would be the maximum punishment for which he would be liable? That would be one half of the longest term of imprisonment that has been prescribed for that offence. Again, there is a discretion with the courts. Again, the maximum which they can award is one half of the maximum term. Here, if the maximum term imprisonment prescribed was 10 years, the court may award a maximum term up to 5 years for attempt to commit that offence or with such fine as is provided for the offence or with both. Now, there are two illustrations appended to this section. What it says, <coughs> illustration A, A makes an attempt to steal some jewels by breaking open a box and finds after so opening the box that there is no jewel in it. Now, he has done an act towards the commission of the theft and therefore is guilty under this section. Now, why is this person guilty? Because he wants to steal jewellery 
and for that he breaks open a box of that is supposed to contain jewels. So, he has the intention to steal jewelry, he commits a preparation and he commits an attempt. He makes prepare, uh, he prepares towards the commission of the crime, he arrives at that spot, he collects the tools and all whatever is required to break open that lock, thereafter he breaks open that box also. But why was his attempt frustrated? Because of supervening circumstances. Now, what are the supervening circumstances or circumstances beyond his control here due to which he could not succeed in stealing those jewels is? Because the box was empty. So, on his part there was a criminal intention, criminal preparation and attempt, but he failed because of supervening circumstances. Had jewellery been there, the crime would have been committed. Because the crime could not be successfully completed, still it is a criminal attempt. So, he can be punished for that. Illustration B. A makes an attempt to pick the pocket of Z by thrusting his hand into Z's pocket. A fails in the attempt in consequence of Z's having nothing in his pocket. A is guilty under this section. So, you see this illustration is quite similar to the earlier illustration. Here there are two people, A who wants to pick the pocket of Z. So, he has this intention, he wants to steal money from Z's pocket. F towards that and what he does, maybe he follows Z, maybe he is standing behind him, maybe he makes an attempt to be at a place where Z is and then towards accomplishing his intention and the preparations that he has made, he attempts to pick the pocket. What he does towards the attempt? He puts his hands into the pocket of Z. Now, had there been money in the pocket of Z, he would have committed the offence of pickpocketing. Why did he fail in this attempt is? Because the pocket of Z was empty. So, why has his attempt failed? because of circumstances beyond his control, because of supervening circumstances. Therefore, the attempt is complete from his side and he would be held guilty of a criminal attempt. Now, what is the difference between definition of attempt under section 62 and the definition of, of attempt to commit murder under section 109? Now, this is a question that, uh, that is very intriguing. And people have been puzzled about this that when we have one broader provision in the form of 62, section 62 which was earlier section 511 which is dealing with all the attempts that are given under IPC, then why do we have a specific provision for attempt to murder or attempt to commit culpable homicide? What is the need for a separate provision? So, what is the difference between these two provisions? So, let us talk about that. Different high courts have different views regarding the scope and ambit of these two sections and whether there is an overlap. The Bombay High Court in R versus Francis Cassidy and the former Chief Court of Punjab in Jeevan Das versus King Emperor had expressed the view that section 511, now 62 of BNS is much wider than section 307 which is now section 109 of the BNS. On the other hand, the Allahabad High Court in Queen versus Nidha expressed a contrary view and stated that 511 does not apply to attempt to murder which has been exclusively provided for by section 307 of the IPC and section 307 is exhaustive and not narrower than section 511 so far as an attempt to commit murder is concerned. The view of Allahabad High Court is more convincing as the legislative intent is not a matter of presumption. It is to be gathered from the language of the statute itself. Attempts to commit certain offences have been made specifically punishable under separate provisions. This implies that our lawmakers intended such attempts to be treated separately and to be dealt with under the specific provisions. So, section 62 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita would apply only to those attempts which have not been specifically provided for under the provisions of the BNS. 
the words where no express provision is made by this code used in section 62 make it amply clear that this section is not meant to cover those cases of attempts which have been made punishable under specific provisions of the IPC. So, what we understand by this is that see section 62, it is a general provision but it does not have an overriding effect. When there is a specific provision which deals with an attempt to commit a specific crime, that is what would prevail because that is indicative of the legislative intent. See what we can do is we have to just interpret, analyze, implement the law, but it is for the legislators who in their legislative wisdom, they decide what is to be made as a law distinctly or what is to be made as a general law and if they have chosen to make specific provisions for attempt to murder, now that is something which would be covered under 307, earlier one, now 109 and it does not mean that that provision is narrower or the other one is broader with a broader uh, uh, amplitude, no. We should not be applying our own notions in order to understand what was the legislative intent. The legislative intent is to be gathered from the debates that took place in the assembly, from the language that has been used in the statute, from the terms, from the statement of uh, objects and reasons of the statute. Now all these are interpretative tools that we can apply in order to understand what the legislative intent was. And when the language is clear, there is no room for any ambiguity or confusion. So, let us not try to read more into the statute than what has already been expressly provided by the legislators. So, that is why this is a more general provision section 62 whereas the other ones are specific provisions and there is no overlap and there is no confusion regarding the implementation of these two. They are both implemented there in their own individual spheres. Now let us discuss some important judgments relating to attempt. In the case of Abhyananda Mishra versus state of Bihar, the accused he applied to the Patna University to appear for MA exam in English as a private candidate. He wanted to appear as a private candidate, so what he did? He supplied documents in support of his application. Now the documents proved that he was a graduate and he was also teaching in a school. Later on, it was found out that the documents were fake. He was held guilty of attempt to cheat because he had gone beyond the stage of preparation. See, had, he had the intention to appear for MA exams. He wanted to appear as a private candidate and towards this end he applied to that university. The university asked for certain documents, he supplied those documents also and the documents were fake. So, the preparation was complete. When he had prepared the application for the purpose of submission to the university, the moment he dispatched it, he entered the realm of attempting to commit the offence of cheating. He did succeed in deceiving the university and inducing it to issue the admit card. He just failed to get it and sit for the examination. Why? Because something beyond his control took place in as much as the university was informed about his being neither a graduate nor a teacher. So you see in this case when we talk about the four stages of attempt, intention, preparation, attempt and the crime. What was the intention of the accused? To appear as a private MA candidate. He did his research, he found out that he needed to submit an application and submit certain documents. He did not have those documents, so he went that extra mile to forge those documents. He filled the application, attached the documents and posted it to the university in order to get the admit card. So, he had the intention and he has prepared also. Now, he did not get the admit card and he could not sit for the examination. Why? Because the university came to know about his illegal intentions. So, before he could commit the crime of cheating, he was caught. His attempt to cheat is nonetheless completed. So, that is how we differentiate preparation from the stage of attempt till the stage of preparation. Had he just kept those documents with himself, maybe the factum of forgery would not have come in the uh, 
eyes of law and maybe he would not have been punished. But the moment he dispatches those documents, he has attempted to cheat. So now his act has moved beyond the stage of preparation which is punishable in itself. Another case. <coughs> In the case of state of Maharashtra versus Muhammad Yaqub, three persons were found with a truck and a jeep loaded with silver near a creek from where they could be easily loaded in some sea craft. Some silver had been unloaded and was found lying near the footpath leading to the sea. The accused were not dealers in silver and upon questioning gave their false name and addresses in a bid to mislead the authorities. The sound of engine of a mechanized boat was also heard from a nearby creek. Convicting them of attempting to smuggle silver, the court held that the intention of accused to export silver from India by sea was clear from the circumstances enumerated above. The facts revealed with reasonable certainty the intention of accused to export the silver. They had reached close to the seashore and the only step that was required to be taken was to load it on a sea craft for moving out of the territorial waters of India. Had the officers of law not intervened, the unlawful export of silver would have consummated. The clandestine disappearance of the sea craft when the officers intercepted and rounded up the vehicles and the accused at the creek reinforces the inference that the accused had deliberately attempted to export silver by sea in contravention of the law. Another case, Malkat Singh versus State of Punjab. A truck which was carrying paddy was stopped at Samalkha border 32 miles from Delhi and about 15 miles from the Delhi-Punjab boundary. Deciding upon the question whether the act of accused amounted to attempt to export paddy from Punjab to Delhi without a license, the Supreme Court held that the offence of attempt had not yet been committed as the offence alleged to be contemplated was so far removed from the completion in the case that the offender yet had ample time an opportunity to change his mind and proceed no further on being warned that they had no license to carry the paddy. The test for determining whether act of appellants constituted an attempt or preparation is whether the overt acts already done are such that if the offender changes his mind and does not proceed further in its progress, the acts already done would be completely harmless. And then this case, Asghar Ali Pradhania versus Emperor. Now, this is a very important judgment. What had happened in this case, that this accused person, he was in illicit relations with his neighbor and he tried to forcibly administer some liquid and powder, which he believed to be poisonous to a pregnant lady in order to induce miscarriage. Because this man, he was not married to this woman. When this woman thought that she was pregnant and she informed this man, he induced her to, uh, uh, to commit miscarriage. And when the woman, she did not want to take this medicine, so he forced her to consume that powder and that liquid, which he believed to be a powder and liquid which would induce miscarriage in the woman. Medical report showed that the substance was harmless and not poisonous. The court, while acquitting the accused of charges of attempt to cause a miscarriage, stated that he did what he did was not an act towards commission of offence of causing miscarriage because neither the liquid nor the powder being harmful, they could not have caused a miscarriage. Now, why did the appellant fail in his attempt? Not because of some supervening circumstances, but because of his own folly. He brought something which he believed was poisonous, whereas that was a totally harmless substance. So, although he had intention and he had preparation to commit the offence, and he also did an attempt. If the substance had been poisonous, the woman would have miscarried and the offence of miscarriage would have taken place. But why did his attempt fail? Because of his own folly. His failure was not due to a factor which was independent to himself. And that is why in this case, criminal attempt could not be constituted. So students, today we discussed about the inchoate crimes of criminal conspiracy and attempt. That will be all for this lesson. Hope you will continue with me in the coming lessons also. Thank you.